Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Real History. In this segment, what we have lined up for you is a classic of the war genre. It is John Huston's 1951 classic, The Red Badge of Courage, based rather dutifully on Stephen Crane's novel from 1895 of the same title. I like to think of this film as a Civil War movie that is in actuality about World War II. In essence, the entirety of the cast is World War II veterans, and most notable among them is Medal of Honor recipient Audie Murphy and Stars and Stripes GI cartoonist Bill Malden. What director John Huston sought to do with this movie is that he wanted to explore the psychological trauma of warfare. This is something that he had seen firsthand as a documentarian for the United States War Department during the Second World War, and he really wanted to move past what he considered to be a lot of the superficiality of war movies that he was seeing being produced in the late 40s and early 1950s. This is a movie that drips with historical context, both in the sense of the 1860s when it is set, and also in the early 1950s when it was filmed. As I was researching this movie, I found a really excellent journal article that describes the making of it, and also a lot of the behind-the-scenes drama that unfolded in the production and post-production of the movie. And this is what the introduction of that article has to say. The film clearly belongs to one of the more turbulent periods in the history of entertainment. It was made during the Korean War, at the height of the Red Scare, when the old studio system was deep in economic trouble because of the rise of television. Thus, the Red Badge of Courage straddles two important cultural movements, one identified with New Deal politics and the other with Cold War anxiety about the Russian acquisition of the atom bomb, leading to what William Grabner calls a more sober and conservative male look. The former attitude guided Houston's director's cut of the Red Badge of Courage. The latter informed MGM's revision. Interestingly, the film arrived on the fault line between very shaky political ground. Indeed, it was literally broken up and reconstructed by the producers. And therefore, this movie about the American Civil War led to a civil war itself within the MGM studio. And we're going to be talking about some of the drama therein. Unfortunately, this movie is considered a truncated masterpiece. Because of all of the political and artistic wheeling and dealing happening behind the scenes, this was taken from a two-hour and 15-minute film, which many thought would be one of the greatest war movies ever made. And because of essentially cowardice on the part of the studio, it was edited down into a 69-minute version, which we will be reviewing on this episode of Real History. The director's cut, it is believed, has been lost to posterity. And so, without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at John Huston's 1951 film, The Red Badge of Courage. The Red Badge of Courage. Stephen Crane was only 22 years old when The Red Badge of Courage was published, and it was immediately recognized for its realism. Many Civil War veterans who read it in the 1890s wondered what regiment uh, this author possibly fought in. Uh, they were convinced in many regards that this had been written by a veteran of the war. Uh, rather, it was written by a young man who thoroughly studied war, had a little bit of daring and adventure. Crane later goes on to become a war correspondent during the Spanish-American War as he was suffering from tuberculosis, and he quite possibly had a death wish as he did so. It was accepted by critics and public alike as a classic story of war and of the boys and men who fought war. The bit of prologue, which is actually narrated by actor James Whitmore, who stars in one of my favorite war films, Battleground, and later goes on to play Brooks in Shawshank Redemption. He, throughout the film, narrates portions of the book, and this was one of the latter revisions to the movie that was conducted by 
Hollywood chief, studio chief, Dory Sherry. And uh, it, this was something that <laughs> went dead against what director John Huston desired. In any case, this little bit of prologue is quite revealing because it says that the publication of the book turned him from a boy into a man. And so already there are these questions about manhood, what it means to be a man, uh, notions of masculinity, and all of this stuff just is replete throughout this movie. Thunderation. Yeah, you just wait. Tomorrow you're going to see the biggest battle you ever saw. You just wait. As Bill Malden is ascending the hillside here, what we see in the background is supposed to be a representation of the Rappahannock River. And it is widely believed that the book Red Badge of Courage is set during the Chancellorsville campaign of May 1863. And I just so happen to be filming this episode on the anniversary of the Battle of Chancellorsville, and so this is quite fitting. In any case, director John Huston wanted to film this movie in Virginia to capture the right aesthetic, but when that proved too costly an option for his budget, they had to do what so many Hollywood war movies had to do, and they filmed it in rural California instead. And certainly, uh, this looks a little bit more arid than the luscious spring countryside of central Virginia in the spring of 1863. What's up, Wilson? No more drilling, Bill. It's all behind us. From now on, it's going to be out and out fighting. Ah, what are you talking about? The feller I know up at headquarters saw the orders. A lot of this scuttlebutt and conversation that we see here among the Civil War soldiers is very common. It is something that we hear about quite often in Civil War letters and memoirs. And the likes of the soldier Elijah Hunt Rhodes from Rhode Island uh, described Civil War soldier life as drill, drill, and followed by more drill. And the opening scenes of this movie certainly capture the essence of that. One of the, the interesting uh, historical dilemmas about this movie is we see from Henry Fleming, Audie Murphy's letter that's being written here, that it is the 10th of September, 1862 which is several months before the Battle of Chancellorsville. And that being the case, we can therefore assume that the movie is set in a different campaign, and in all likelihood, it is the Maryland campaign of September 1862. And so perhaps some of the future battle scenes depicted in this movie might be the Battle of South Mountain or even the Battle of Antietam. Although I think it's supposed to be rather vague and mysterious. It doesn't really matter what battle is. It's not about a battle. It's about the experience of battle. I'll bet on it. What's the matter, Henry? You scared? Scared? Me? Of course not. John Huston realized the irony of casting Audie Murphy as this shy young boy who demonstrates uh, fear and anxiety throughout much of the film. And of course, he was a Medal of Honor recipient, having fought with the 3rd Infantry Division across Europe. And what John Huston wanted to do is that he wanted to balance that sense of shy, reserved humanity with also this fierce violence that was found within Audie Murphy. Are you a Reb? I don't see much point in us sisters shooting each other, especially when we ain't fighting no battle. These sorts of interactions among pickets on either side of the Rappahannock River were not all that uncommon. And despite how uncivil the American Civil War could be, there were indeed these moments of shared humanity where there would be friendly banter uh, across the riverbanks and or even trading uh, in certain instances. Uh, this is a likewise a sort of scenario that's depicted in other Civil War movies, including Gods and Generals, which we've also taken a look at here on this channel. We can all go up the river, huh. across, and come around in behind them. Just wait till we fall out, Bill Porter. I'll learn you something. Private Wilson, step forward. Is that you talking, Ranks? Despite how faithful the script, the original script, was to the book, the material culture within this movie is much to be desired. We see a hodgepodge of 
Civil War era equipment with a later 19th century features. We see the crossed rifles on the Kepis. Uh, we see ammunition boxes, perhaps from the 1880s or from the 1890s. Uh, and I'm sure it's all surplus equipment that is vintage. Uh, I, I doubt that a lot of this equipment uh, was reproduced for the specific purposes of this film. But once again, it's not trying to capture that sort of authenticity. It's trying to get to these deeper truths about warfare. They're going to wish they'd stayed to home. I hope this here gun shoots straight, that's all. Wouldn't worry about that gun if I was you. I'd worry about how steady I was holding it. Wished I had my dog along. What this movie does is that it uses a very similar formula that we can find in a lot of other World War II movies of this era. What we have is the platoon. We have people from all walks of life with different personalities, with different outlooks, with different apprehensions and anticipations about combat, and they very freely express those sorts of notions and sentiments to each other. It's very effective yet simple storytelling. The man that bets on my running is going to lose his money, that's all. Shucks you. You're the bravest man in the world, are you? One of the really distinctive things about this movie is the cinematography. There are often extreme close-ups placed upon the actors, and this is meant to capture pathos. It is meant to capture anxiety, that degree of dread. Uh, we see uh, drops of sweat coming down their faces. It is uh, very good, and it's very unique for this time period. The idea of uh, really intimate close-ups, uh, it's not something that we see in a lot of 1940s movies of this time. Here we are introduced to our first corpse in the movie, and I think one of the things that's very telling about the Red Badge of Courage is that it shares so many aesthetics with John Huston's staged documentary called The Battle for San Pietro. Uh, this was a documentary that came out in May of 1945, uh, just a few weeks after the war in Europe had come to an end. And Bill Malden considered The Battle for San Pietro to be perhaps the greatest documentary about war that had ever been made. What a lot of people weren't aware of at the time is that John Houston had missed much of the battle. There were still soldiers milling about in the area in the days afterward, and he asked them to restage some of their fighting. And so what that documentary is, is that it's a mishmash of real footage with staged combat scenes. A lot of people didn't know that, though. One thing that is not staged, though, is this very harrowing depiction of young American soldiers being placed into cloth body bags after the smoke has cleared. And as John Huston later recognized, this was a film that was no good advertisement for war. And he later says in his autobiography, the War Department no, wanted no part of the film. I was told by one of its spokesmen that it was anti-war. I pompously replied that if I ever made a picture that was pro-war, I hoped somebody would take me out and shoot me. The guy looked at me as if he were considering just that. The film was classified secret and filed away to ensure that it would be, not be viewed by enlisted men. The Army argued that the film would be demoralizing to men who were going into combat for the first time. This too became one of the problems for the Red Badge of Courage. And as the Red Scare was going on and there were these fears of anti-war and pro-communism and very liberal agendas that were in place, uh, studio head Dory Sherry was concerned if we make this movie too anti-war, the House on american Activities Committee might come after us, they might blackball the studio, might ruin the careers of a lot of people who are involved with the making of this film, and sadly, that is what leads to the film being snipped accordingly. In any case, this shot of the dead U.S. soldier in the road, it is eerily similar to some scenes that we see in the battle for San Pietro. So, art imitates life or life imitates art. It works either way in regard to this movie. 
What kind of a battle is this where fellas lay down to fight? I ain't to do my fighting standing up or I ain't gonna fight at all. You wanna get shot, that's your own business. One of the other things that this movie exceeds at is showing the frustration of soldiers. They don't know where they're going. Here they just finished preparing a fixed position and then they're ordered to move on. They don't get to use it. We see the exact same thing in the movie Battleground made just two years prior to this. Also a product of MGM, also produced by Dory Sherry. And so there's a lot of crossover between this movie and that movie. Interestingly, Battleground was a big hit. The Red Badge of Courage, though, it's going to become a big flop. It's going to lose over a million dollars at the box office. Henry, oh boy, listen, it's my first and last battle. Something tells me it's my first and last battle. I'm a gone goose. I just know it. I want you to take this and send it to my folks. Here we see another universal element of both war and the war movie, and that is the premonition of death. Handing over that last stack of letters to a comrade, giving your gold pocket watch to your best buddy, letting your family know that you died with your face to the enemy. In the Civil War times, this was known as the Ars Moriendi. The notion of dying the good death and the importance of letting your family members know that you died valiantly. This was a very important concept to uh, notions of Victorian chivalry and honor. Even though many of the combat scenes within this movie are rather ragtag looking, we very rarely see uh, battle lines of, uh, of soldiers who are uh, uh, marching and fighting shoulder to shoulder. What I can appreciate, though, is the sense of scope. Uh, John Huston used the landscape quite effectively, and he knows how to fill a camera screen. Yet another highly ironic moment where we see Audie Murphy, the war hero, running away in fear. Uh, this was apparently something that Audie Murphy as an actor had trouble dealing with. He had a reputation by this point. This is a good four years before he stars in the autobiographical film To Helen Back. And the notion of him running away, being called a coward, engaging in that sort of dialogue about cowardice, it is something that did not rest easily with him. And this is something that uh, Bill Malden himself attested to. And it seemed uh, in his mind that there was you know, some sort of wildcat or some sort of wild energy or force with inside Audie Murphy that could make him lash out at anybody at any given moment. Murphy had the tendency to become engaged in fistfights and brawls with uh, stuntmen. And undoubtedly, as we look back on it now, uh, he is undoubtedly coping with post-traumatic stress in the early 1950s. And whether or not this movie either helped or hurt him confront some of those challenges is up to speculation. Don't jostle so, Johnson, you fool. You think my leg's made of iron? If you can't carry me decent, put me down. Let someone else do it. Here we see a a captain who is wounded and he's having enlisted men uh, drag him to the rear, uh, played by the wonderful character actor of the era by the name of Whit Bissell. And it almost harkens back to a lot of the Willie and Joe cartoons that Bill Malden did. Uh, you have this spoiled officer who's having the enlisted men uh, do the dirty work. And by God, if that lieutenant or captain wants it done, then it better be done, uh, no matter what. They ain't had no fair chance up to now. But this time they showed what they was. I know they turn out this way. You can't lick them boys. No, sir. They're fighters, A.B. Where you at, old boy? Another wonderful character actor that we see here is a man by the name of Royal Dano. And uh, he is uh, listed in the credits as the Tattered Man. And sadly, uh, his really great performance in this movie was uh, shredded down to an inkling of its former self. Uh, he had this really traumatic act 
uh, in which he had recounted everything that he had gone through. And sadly, this scene was one of the many that was discarded in the heap uh, by the time the studio had its way with it. Uh, and so uh, a lot of really great performances that were in the original cut have been lost to posterity. And Royal Dano very well may have been nominated for a Best Supporting Actor Oscar had that not happened. Partner, there's a battery coming here. Let's whoop down the road. He get run over for sure. Cigar. Jim! Jim! Jim, why don't you do it? Jim. No. No. Don't touch me. I've shown this movie in my Civil War cinema class, and yes, I actually do have a class entitled that. And at this scene, in which actor John Dirks, uh, also known as the Tall Soldier, reaches his point of breaking, he reaches the point of lethal exhaustion, uh, students watching this are visibly shaken and shocked uh, by this performance. It's not what they expect. It's very visceral. It's often uncommon, at least in their minds, for a black and white movie. And what John Huston is trying to do here is that he is trying to demonstrate the culmination of battle fatigue. Present the idea, the representation of the utterly exhausted soldier who is completely winded. He has the 2,000 yard stare and ultimately his experiences break him. And that is what we see happen to the character of Jim Conklin in this movie. It's very compelling stuff. Of course, they'll say we won a big victory. Got to keep the people's spirits up back home, especially the women folks. They might have to get discouraged what with their husbands and their sons away. Hey, Corporal, that the 304th down there? They even have World War II style unit designations. Uh, very rarely uh, did states or regiments during the Civil War uh, reach the likes of the 304th Regiment. Uh, something that we very much hear more so in the 1940s rather than the 1860s. What this also shows, uh, this scene as Audie Murphy is being taken back to camp by the cheery soldier, is the wide spectrum of personalities that one encounters in wartime. How do individual soldiers cope with what they are seeing? Some of them handle it better than others, and we get a sense of that dynamic in this little nighttime conversation. The blonde-haired lieutenant is performed by actor Douglas Dick, and as far as I could tell, I believe that he was the last billed actor in this film to, to die. Uh, he passed away in the year 2015 at the age of 95. Two years prior to this film, he had a very prominent role in the Alfred Hitchcock movie suspense film, Rope. The youth was not conscious that he was erect upon his feet. He lost every sense but his hate. For the first time in his life, he was possessed by a great passion. Here's to where we get a little sense of real life Audie Murphy swinging into action on the film here. Uh, the idea of uh, a one man fighting machine uh, holding off an enemy attack of uh, numerical superiority. Uh, except this time he's doing it with a musket instead of a 50 caliber machine gun on top of a burning tank destroyer. But you nonetheless get that sense of the heroic Audie Murphy being evoked here. Good afternoon, boys. Good afternoon, General. We're going to give the Rebs a good licking today, aren't we, boys? Yeah. What are you having for supper tonight? Hard tack and sow belly, General. I'll be around if you fix an extra plate. Uh, here, too, we see that sense of uh, detached officers and generals who are riding up to the front lines, giving their men lip service. They aren't being very genuine. It's almost like they're putting on a play. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, there was a rather tense dynamic between Bill Malden and Audie Murphy on set because Audie Murphy had this idea that Bill Malden was a rear echelon ink slinger. <laughs> Those are the exact words uh, that he used. Uh, and so there was not only antagonism against officers as depicted in the film, but there's also antagonism against perceived real, real life 
rear echelon blankety blank uh, being played out on the other side of the camera as this movie is being filmed. Fascinating stuff. Sound the attack. I will be done, sir. I love this portrayal done by actor Tim Durant who plays the general in this film. He has the perfect Civil War facial growth, one of the best that I've ever seen in a Civil War movie. He very easily could have played Union General George Sears Green. Audie Murphy found part of this climactic moment where the character of Henry Fleming grabs the flag and urges his men onward to be rather cliche and not realistic, but I think in some ways it shows how the, the sensibilities of heroism changed in a mere 80 year time period. If you look at how many U.S. soldiers received the Medal of Honor during the Civil War, it was because they either led the flag forward or they captured the enemy colors. Uh, a huge number of Civil War combatants gained the nation's highest honor by doing that. In contrast to what Audie Murphy did, killing a lot of soldiers, a lot of enemy combatants. Uh, and so the standards for which the medal is given out, it, it changes considerably in the course of one's lifetime. I do enjoy this scene with the two opposing battle flags because we have this uh, very uh, energized rendition of the battle hymn of the Republic being played as Henry Fleming is pushing forward, but then it's contrasted to this very dark and sinister orchestral piano music where a Confederate cowboy bearer is uh, uh, limping his last steps. Uh, and it's a good contrast between heroism and horror. And if only it, that sort of theme could have been explored more had the movie not been butchered in the editing room. What state are you fellas from? We are from Tennessee. How about y'all? We're from Ohio. I ain't never spoke to nobody from Ohio before. I never spoke to nobody from Tennessee. I can't help but think that uh, this interaction between the Confederate prisoner and the U.S. soldier uh, received uh, its own interpretation in Michael Scherer's The Killer Angels, where we see a similar conversation playing out between the character of Thomas Chamberlain and a Confederate prisoner. Uh, and so I have no doubt that perhaps Scherer was giving a little bit of a tip of the hat to Stephen Crane in constructing a scene as such. Oh, Fleming, you just ought to heard. Heard what? It's the darnest thing. The colonel and the captain was talking. And the colonel says, ahem, ahem, he says, Captain Aldworth, by the way, who was the lad that carried the flag? And speaking of connections to other Civil War movies, uh, the one wounded soldier with the sling around his arm is portrayed by actor Robert Easton, who also has a role at the outset of the movie Gods and Generals. Like I said, you can also check out that movie in three parts on our channel. But we figured you were shooting at crows. <laughs> crows, huh? Yeah. We was fighting a battle. Did you hear that, Jake? What was that? Well, you darn fools, the battle was over that. I like this exchange, too, <laughs> where the, the U.S. troops are saying, oh, you, you missed the battle. The real fighting was, you know, a few miles away in that direction or the like. And this was a sentiment expressed by troops at, at encounters such as the Battle of Gettysburg. Some of these battles are, are so large and so vast in scope that you have no sense of fighting that is going on perhaps two miles from your position. Uh, you are looking dead straight ahead. You are so focused to your immediate surroundings uh, that you're kind of oblivious to the broader drama that's unfolding around you. And certainly this was true during World War II battles as well, but it speaks to the sort of tunnel vision that one can have in combat. And it's a really useful scene that we see here. The sun's going down. The days are getting shorter all the time. I reckon we'll be home for spring planting. Just listen to them birds.
I love this final little bit of meditation that we have at the end of the movie. In my mind, it's kind of reminiscent of the end of Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line that shows a little palm tree starting to grow up out of the beach. And here instead what we see is we see sunlight shining through this large tree. We hear birds chirping. And what all of this evokes is that sense that life goes on. Uh, and in this case, as we get a sense of from the, the troops uh, marching into the distance, is that here too, the war goes on as well. But more broadly speaking, uh, life goes on. And I think it's something rather poignant for us to think about. If we really want to get a sense of what this movie is all about, and perhaps what John Huston was trying to achieve, it behooves us to look at his documentary entitled Let There Be Light, which comes out in the spring of 1946. What John Huston did in the final stages of World War II is that he followed U.S. soldiers into a hospital as they were seeking psychological treatment for their war wounds. These were men who had been put through the meat grinder they were all suffering from acute post-traumatic stress, uh, a clinical term that hadn't even been uh, coined yet. And he followed them through and he traced their progress. And it is an incredibly moving film that has so much heart, that has so much humanity. And it also shows us what war can do to individuals. That film is available in its entirety since it was a government produced film available on YouTube through the National Archives. If you want to get a good sense of John Huston's career and also the soldier experience of the Second World War, that is a documentary that you absolutely have to watch. Sadly though, in 1946, the War Department did not want that film to get out. It was going to premiere at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was reportedly pulled at the last minute and it was a movie that was suppressed for 35 years because once again John Huston recognized the fact that this too is not an advertisement for war. And in the context of the Cold War as well, uh, it wasn't a very good recruiting poster for the US military. And uh, here too is why the Red Badge of Courage perhaps failed to find an audience. It was cut down to its final 69 minutes. It was relegated to B-picture purgatory in movie theaters. It didn't gain much of an audience and it's an incredibly disappointing outcome because indeed it could have been right up there with All Quiet on the Western Front had John Huston been permitted to follow his vision, stay true to the original script. But here, like in so many other cases with the Red Scare, uh, artistic expression as well as political discourse was diminished in consequence. And the Red Badge of Courage became a victim of that paranoia and those restrictive sensibilities of the early 1950s. So ultimately, the Red Badge of Courage tells us as much about the Second World War and its immediate aftermath as much as the Civil War itself. Like all historical films, it is a product of its time. It tells us as much about 1951 as it does about the year 1863. It's a fascinating glimpse into that era of filmmaking. As always, before we head out, I have some reading recommendations for you. If you want to have a really good perspective on the experiences of Union soldiers during the Civil War, you can't go wrong with the classic The Life of Billy Yank by Bell Irvin Wiley. This was a book that was published in 1951, the same year that this movie, The Red Badge of Courage, was released. And uh, it's conceivable that maybe they had a copy of that book on set so the actors could get into the right mindset. The, another book that you want to check out is Bill Malden, A Life Up Front by my friend Todd DePastino. This is a great biographical glimpse of an artist turned soldier turned journalist, 
who receives the Pulitzer Prize on more than one occasion, and part of that book uh, traces the, the rather tense interactions that Bill Malden and Audie Murphy had as they were filming this movie. Uh, you won't be disappointed in that read either. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Real History. If you enjoy our channel, please check out some of the links below where you can visit our website, buy a nice Real History t-shirt, or even consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support is always much appreciated and it allows us to continue on our work. Until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.